Mexico at the time called MS Group. And this guy now uh, was almost a, a genius inventor, a chemist, a chemist, a genius chemist. And um, he, basically, uh, he basically reinvented how we create scents at the time. He was working with the Tsar, with the Russian Tsar. Uh, he was working with a lot of royal family around Europe at the time. And at the time, a perfume in 1920 is all about flowers, it's something for women. So it's for, first it's for women, it's very kitsch. It's, uh, the name of the perfume were like little blue flower you wear in the morning or like and Gabriel Chanel wanted something um, rough, she wanted something pure, artificial and like um, it was like a, a Mondrian painting in a way, she wanted to break, to actually break the chemistry of the perfume and create something abstract and she, want, and she tried to explore uh, chemistry for that and the, the, there was a strong connection between Ernest Beau, this perfumer, and her and together they invented this, this smell that is one of the, the one that sticks the most in the history and um, I, I discovered that it's called number five because she was presented with five samples of, the, of, of perfume and she picked the number five and she decided to call it this way it's, a, it's almost like a, it's a chemist sample and, and to put it in the simplest way, uh, in the simplest bottle and make it something abstract and bold and, and relevant for the time. And this is very avant-garde and now we take it for granted. We are you it's almost like the smell from an old age, but it was in, immensely modern. And so I wanted to um, to try and explore this anecdote through VR and I decided to um, basically to write this piece that is an immersive blending element of immersive theater. In Rencontre you have uh, live comedians uh, playing with you. You have an element of, of uh, space you can wander inside, and um, and yeah, and, and so uh, I think the connection you get with uh, a story by using this medium was uh, really interesting. So you suggested that you stage, you design this uh, story, and then you approached uh, uh, Chanel, and then they said eventually yes, and so they financed the piece. From that moment, it's a little bit the same question as I was asking Guillaume. How did the connection between you and your commissioner, in a way, uh, work? How did you go through the process of making the piece? What was Chanel input in, in, the, in the making of this piece? I, I actually was very lucky. Uh, I had been working with brands before. I did uh, immersive pieces for Prada, for example, and it was commission work, like you say. This is not a commission work at all. Um, I was really lucky because they showed me the, the archive at Chanel, they gave me full freedom to explore the period, they gave me access to documents and, and anecdotes that was never heard before. And it's, it's not a commission work, it's really a co-creation. They were part of the writing of the piece, um, they, were really, um, they were really open to the format, even if they, it was a cur shared curiosity, I think they they already financed the Bal de Paris with Blancali, so they knew VR already, but they had never, they had never explored something and be part of the, of the creative process from the start. So to me, it was also an adventure of like co-creation, trying to find common grounds, trying to understand what they wanted to say, not wanted to say, and also it's an historical subject, so, and I did not want it to make it a marketing piece. So that was my, kind of my start. And I said, okay, uh, I, I will work with you on this subject, but I want freedom. And if I discover something in your archive and I want this anecdote to, to shine, and they were really open to that. So uh, it was um, it was a really, um, it was a really, um, I don't have the word in, French, in, uh, in English, but bienveillant. Yeah, welcoming. It was a really welcoming collaboration. I think it's, it's uh, something that's pretty unique. In, uh, in collaboration between artists and brands and this is something that I'm really willing to explore more because I think it's, it's the beginning of a new model also on how to work with, with brands and keep your creative freedom and do something that is uh, still relevant for them in terms of marketing and communication and at the same time it's, it's, uh, it's an art piece and they let the director express himself through format so I think it's, a, it's an interesting balance. Is the piece going to travel after Venice? And is this something that is part of the plan to make a tour? Because it's quite complex. It's just 
for, it's, it's a little bit haute couture of VR because it's for only one spectator and it's quite a, a large uh, footprint to set, it's a whole set. You are using a live performer. Um, is, is this something that could travel in that way? Oh, definitely. So we had that in mind from the start of the project. So we have different versions like Notre Dame. This is what you see here is the highest installation kind of, sort of uh, format to it. But we also thought about autonomous format where you can teleport. And this, uh, this actual uh, piece will be uh, showcased in 13 countries uh, in the next uh, in the upcoming months. Um, we have in between versions something that is and it's a smaller installation without the physicality, but you can wander inside. Um, we, we thought, and when, when I wrote the piece, I wrote also the different portability of it, because I knew that the premium installation would be kind of the flagship to it, and then it would be to tour on the different formats. Um, I can't announce it officially yet, but it will also be in a, in a major video in Paris in the coming months, this installation. So um, it's also something that we thought from the start. We have five languages already developed. We have it uh, in Chinese, in Korean, in Japanese. Uh, Mario Cotillard actually dubbed the English and the French version of ourselves. Um, but yeah, it's something we have uh, at the start thought about.